Live from New York, it's <laughs> a couple people talking about Python for talking hours. Talking about Python. Yeah, so Yay. I have to get to here, but we're at the engineer desk. It's me, Lady Ada. With me is Carol, I'm a Pythonista, and we're going to be talking about Python for a bit. So a little hack chat about Python, Circuit Python, Pythons, snakes. education, you know, we community. Our, remember Pythons, but um, yeah, we're we're working on a, a fun thing. So uh, this is Phil. I'm off camera. Phil's just camera control. However, I also wanted to mention that uh, Stella's here. Stella, our CFO. Say hi, Stella. Whoa. Yay, <laughs> she Stella. was totally hiding. I know. Yeah. Hello. So, um, Stella will be in the Discord chat. Um, we'll be doing a bunch of stuff behind the scenes. Um, but thanks for hanging out today, Stella. Yeah. And you tell your, ki your, your kids Python. So that's good. Yes. Cool. Yes. Yes. It's good. Yeah. More. Newbies. Noobs. Yeah. But uh, the best kind of noobs. Yeah. Early, early beginner. Early beginner. Now that's she's got a whole bunch of new music stuff for them, too. Yeah. Know, no. We were talking. We were talking. You were totally like, it's like showing her that coolest, hottest new music Python. Yeah. 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 All right, okay. but we're, we're here to hang out. We should talk about Python for the next, like, half hour. Yeah. Um, Sounds great. A couple of logistic -y things. Yeah. Um, we're going to be giving away trinkets later. That's why a lot yes. of folks are here. Yay. Yes. So we're in Discord, um, and if you want to go there and get more information, we have live broadcasts going across a few different networks. So the chat is at adafruit.it slash Discord. You can go in there. Lots of cool people in there. And you'll have instructions on how to win a trinket shortly, but that's where just that, hang out. That's where you want to be. Okay, so let's introduce our special engineer guest. Yes. We have two engineers now. Wow, double your money. Yes. It's good value. Yes. Uh, with two double E's. Two double E's. Yep. Uh, and your did you get an E degree or a CS degree? Both? I have a double E degree. Oh yay! Go double E's. <laughs> our, our, usually our wrists hurt less, but now we try to do yeah. more typing than ever. Um, it's kind of why I got into EE, because I kept getting a carpal tunnel. So I was like, oh, I'll solder more, but then I ended up just being firmware. Yeah, well, you know, I'm a little older than you, so CS was actually a relatively new thing. Oh, it then, was, like, weird. It was EE a fad. was, like, the big thing, and so, but I always loved coding, so. All right. Okay, well, both. you're Carol, so we have a little slide for people who are like, who is this person? I mean, like, you're here. Yeah. But this is you. That is me. So you do a lot. Standard issue, conference bio slide. <laughs> okay, so, so you're in San Diego, but you're a core developer of C Python, which is kind of what the, the Python version that most people use because it's written in C. That's true. And uh, Python. And Python. And you're also a recent director of the Python Software Foundation. You're a software engineer at Cal Poly, and you work on Project Jupiter. Yes. Which is really cool. You know what's funny? Actually, after you visited last time and you told me about Jupiter, and then I kept hearing about it. I was like, you know what? I should install it. And it's yeah, you I should install it. it. I know, but you know, you know how it's like. <laughs> we you get so much stuff. They're like, oh, I'm totally gonna get to this like framework. And I, know. I did, but you we know, use a lot of data for it. It's helped me a lot with yeah. my um, DSP stuff. So like, I I do modeling. Like before I oh, yeah. the code, I model it in Python, and I do all my pseudo code in Absolutely. Python. Absolutely. And then I port it to C. Yeah. It's like totally a hack. I love it. There's a C plus plus kernel too that you can use in yeah. the notebook. Neat. So. Yeah, but it's like I, I import all my data, you know, I, I dump the data nice. from, from like the hardware and then like I import it, and, you know, and then I get to run all my filters because I'm like, I don't want to run on hardware because it takes forever. I run it super fast. I just restart. I try different things. And then when I'm happy and I'm like, wow, this is like super fun. And then I save the notebook and it makes these beautiful graphs and stuff. It does. It oh. does great visualizations. It's really easy to get started. It's something that personally over the next year or so, I want to really start doing some uh, K through 12 notebooks for education. Yeah. And um, 
hopefully some with CircuitPython too. Yeah, I think it's, it's totally revolutionized like data science. Like people I meet now who are biologists who are doing data science, they're like, yep, I just do my stuff in Jupyter Notebook. Like, yeah. it saves me a lot of effort and money. Like you don't have to pay for expensive licenses. Well, and that's the thing. It's all open source. Um, project Jupyter is actually an academic research project. And because it's open source, you don't have to pay any licensing fees and you get all the goodness of all the Python libraries and and you don't have to go to GNU plot either. No offense to GNU plot. <laughs> I love GNU plot, but like, you know what? I'm really happy I don't have to run GNU plot anymore. Yeah, I mean, there are some amazing 3D visualizations where you can manipulate things in 3D space and and have animations in it. I mean, there's some really cool stuff. It's got that like half MATLAB, half like LaTeX, like happiness to it, where it's like, ooh, this is so pretty. Yeah. And well, you can like, run LaTeX in it. Yeah, and it's like, I want to just put this in my papers and stuff. You know, yeah. it's like, yeah, this good feeling. So that's Jupyter. And yeah, if people can download it right now and install it. Yeah, I was, absolutely. I was going to say, maybe you could start, because we have a lot of young folks that maybe don't even know what Python is. We could start with Python, oh, yeah. maybe Python Foundation, and then sure. a little bit of Jupyter. All right, let's reel it back. Yeah. To Python, do you want to click on the Python slide? Yeah. Let's yeah, click yeah. on it. Can... Okay, this is the this is the Python. What's Python? That was okay, one of the so questions already. What's Python? Guido Van Rossum, he made this thing. Yes, what he did this make thing? this thing. What is this thing? It is um, a programming language, very similar to C or Ruby or other languages you might have heard. But one of the things that Guido did when he developed the language, he wanted a language that would be accessible for anyone to use. Mm -hmm. And so the syntax is very readable and, you know, it has a minimal amount of like parentheses and braces and things like that. So it works more with like spacing across a line. Yeah. Um, but it is it's very visual so you read it and it's like it's hard to make really ugly python code like that's not contest here but yes you know you've, everyone who's here here has seen some really traumatic c code right you can't really do that with python as much no you can't do that with well i suppose you could but it, it's, it's hard it's, it's hard <laughs> yeah. um but yeah i mean so it winds up being a really excellent beginner language and like mm -hmm. MIT switched over a number of years ago to using Python in their intro. From Scheme, they used Lisp yep. variant and now yep. they're using Python. Yep. And, and a lot of school, I hear actually a lot of schools are learning Python like when I, when I talk to teachers are saying, oh yeah, like by seventh or eighth grade, we're actually starting to introduce them to Python. Yeah. And also, I mean, there's some really good books for younger folks in Python that, um, and Raspberry Pi has also been, the ra and the Raspberry Pi Foundation. The Pi in Raspberry Pi actually stands for Python. It does. It does. It does. It totally does. And I That's think. That's not a joke. It's for real. Eben said so. Like he's like, yo, the pie yeah. is Python. Oh, absolutely. And it's one of those things that because the syntax is so clean, it's a really user friendly way to get started with Python, which is why I'm so excited about CircuitPython and Python. all the stuff that edu Adafruit's doing with education because even more people will learn Python and be able to kind of fabricate their ideas and, and make things I got a question that from the chat. are meaningful. Yeah. What do you think, especially um, like K through 12 and then also colleges moved from some of the other programming languages to Python? Were there anything, anything specific? Because it, it, I know it took a while, but like we live in decades. Yes. It seemed to happen really fast. Like what, what, what were the reasons from your point of view as an educator and, and talking with all these folks and then Jupyter Notebooks later? You know, I think for a long time, Java was maybe the beginner totally. language. And um, the Java library got bigger and bigger. And, you know, there's syntax, there's a lot of syntax, whereas there isn't as much um, overhead that you need to learn in order to get started with Python. So you can do something meaningful in Python in five lines of code or less. And I think that's one of the things that makes it um, more accessible for beginners because the commands are actually doing something meaningful. Yeah. And it's making it easier to use. And I think it was just a matter of the fact that Python as a language is fabulous, but the Python libraries, as well as the Python community, is so strong. Like the there's so many different libraries that you can use with Python to do anything from music to engineering to visualizations. But the community itself has been for a number of years run a young coder programming uh, workshop at different conferences that we have that teaches people how to make a game and 
and um, and and when I say people, I mean young people that are, you know, late elementary through middle school. And I think, you know, it's a matter of I think the community has a strong emphasis on education. Yeah. And that just reinforces learning. Yeah, it's it's the 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 Python community. I think is interesting because I see it. You know, I'm kind of a little bit of an outsider because I'm not. I use Python, but I, I I was kind of late to it. But it, I like how there's so many different efforts, but they don't interfere with each other. Like, it's easy to get started, but there's really advanced math libraries, you know? Right. So it's like the people who want to do data science, they don't end up kind of bashing on the people who are trying to do like the music stuff. Do you know what I mean? Like sometimes in in languages, there is this push and pull of like, well, what do we want to use it for? And whatever the main usage kind of dictates the language and in Python it seems like they're there's like a happy uh, detent it's like everyone's okay with everyone's okay with w- what's going on is you know and they just work on their library and their piece right I mean I think that's a, a credit to the core Python developers that are developing the core language instead of trying to put everything in the core language the you know, main functionality is in the core language, but things that are more specific to say engineering or music or, um, you know, language processing or things like that are separate libraries. So those libraries can develop on top of the core and it's less contentious in terms of features competing with each other. Yeah. And you're also, um, like we said, you're, you're a member of the Python software. What's, what's it called? It's a foundation. Python Foundation. Software yeah. Foundation. What do they do? What do they do? You guys have great parties, right? Mm, I don't know about that. <laughs> um, but I... Ragers. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I well, have, maybe. I pulled up the mission statement because I, I think for foundations, it's always good to have a sentence. Yeah. Yes. What it is, but I really like this one. Y- yeah. It, the mission of the Python Software Foundation is really to protect the language itself and to foster the language, but also even equally as important or perhaps even more important is to to help facilitate the growth of Python throughout the world and throughout different communities. And I think what we're trying to do is not only develop a language, but develop a community of programmers in Python. Mm -hmm. And the Software Foundation tends to be, um, it's an elected board, and it tends to be people that have been involved in Python and very passionate about both the language and about the community. So we'll do grants for conferences, we do grants for workshops around the world, and you know, like the last two years, like there's been a huge growth in workshops in Africa and South America, and um, I think that is really where the strength of Python lies, is the huge network of people that are using it. Mm. So if folks want to um, contribute not only code, maybe they're not a coder, but they like what Python's doing, Sure. Um, can they donate to the Python Foundation? They can donate to the Python Foundation. Um, there is a link. Anybody can become a basic member of the Python Foundation for free. So you know, if you're using Python at all or have an interest in it, um, feel free to go to the membership link. Um, There are also, um, on the website, there's a way to easily install different versions of Python for your operating system. And there are lots and lots of tutorials out there. And a great resource is a community resource called pyvideo.org. And that catalogs all the talks and tutorials that happen at any um, Python-sponsored conference. And they're all free and open source and available online. And it's some great learning content. If somebody was interested, I'm sure people in the chat are like, hey, I want to learn Python. I've been meaning to. What is there like a a website you recommend that you like? You know, it depends on the age of the person. Um, If for those that are comfortable with GitHub, Jake Vanderplas has a great um, whirlwind tour of Python that is done in the Jupyter Notebooks that people can um, run. Whirlwind tour of Python. Whirlwind tour of Python. A tornado. Good segue. Yeah. And then there's also um, the Raspberry Pi Foundation has some great learning resources um, and also Magpie Magazine, which is an open source magazine about Raspberry Pi, but also programming in general. is also a fantastic resource. And then there's a number of 
books that are out there targeted to various age levels. We have Python for Kids, people like that one. People do like Python for Kids. It's not just for kids. No, it's not just for kids. In it's fact, I would teach workshops, and that was one of the books that I would bring with me was Python for Kids because... It's a little bit of a trick. You say it's for kids, but it's really like, for oh, adults. Well, if it's yeah. for kids, I can do it. Yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, uh, around many places in the world, there are local Python meetups, and those meetups, um, by and large, do a really good job of running workshops and doing outreach and um, helping others learn Python, so. Okay, okay so next up, because it already came up in the, in okay. the chat. So what's Jupyter? Like, it what completely took over how we do data visualization here, but um, in your words, you do, you do this all the time. What is what is Jupyter? It, you know, Jupyter is like, it, what we call it an interactive notebook, but what it allows you to do is combine code, prose, visualizations, pictures, YouTube videos, uh, audio, and kind of make it so it's interactive. And, and so if I was teaching a lesson, say on muse, on maybe on physics, I might start with a visualization of a soccer ball being kicked and like the arc of a parabola or something like mm -hmm. that. And then I might underneath that have some um, uh, text about what is happening from a physics standpoint. And then I might have a code that I, a uh, code cell that I could run just by hitting shift enter. And in that code cell, it would um, actually show you the mathematical formulas behind yeah. it. So it's one of those ways to collaborate with other people, um, to get people up the learning curve a lot quicker and um, it's something that can also you can also publish as yeah. well. So. It's kind of in a sense, it's like it seems like it's like a wrapper over the Python interface, the programming language where you have code, text, images, and you can interleave them. Absolutely. So it's basically like instead of having one text file, which is you know I love text files like main.py, and then you have comments. Right. It's a little bit more advanced in that you can have code, and then you can literally drag an image in and have the image in between all the Absolutely. code. So it's like it's kind of like. Um, like, I hate to say, like, rich text programming. It's like... It, sort of. It, I mean, it, it, one of the... Interactive programming. It's interactive, definitely, and it supports a lot of different... Um, oh, so there's, like, a, a notebook image in the, yeah. top, in the top left there. And, like, if you go to try.jupiter.org, and mm, Jupiter is server, with yeah. a Y, you can um, actually launch um, a notebook and um, play around with it yourself. I think one of the great things that I like using it for is prototyping. Because much like digital cameras, when they replace sort of the film cameras, you know, you can take a picture and if you don't like it, you delete it. Well, it's the same thing now with a code cell. You can write a few lines of code. If it doesn't work the way you think it should, mm. you can either write another block of code below that does the same thing but a little tweak, or you can just delete it or change the values in it. Yeah. So it's really interactive that that's, way. That's an interesting analogy because it's true. It's like compiling and uploading code now is like film cameras where you take a photo and you're like, well, I don't know what's going to happen until like a few minutes later. Exactly. This is like, no, you get a preview instantly. Right. And you can say like, well, is this preview even close to what I want? And if it is, and you can flesh it out. If not, you don't, you don't have to start from the beginning with like, okay, take a new, you know, set up your camera, take a new photo. All right, together. and that's one of the things that I kind of like about CircuitPython too is, you know, it used to be you'd have to like download all this stuff and then load it onto the thing, onto the board and like have it all, you know, compile before you load it on the board. And with CircuitPython, you can just sort of write your code file and then it kind of loads to the board and runs like instant. that. Yeah, it's instant. Yeah. Instant camera. So a question from the okay. chat, Lady Ada. Yeah. Um, so we use Jupyter Notebooks at Adafruit, and that's a very specific mm -hmm. thing, and we run a business. We also do open source. We also like Python. So what are the, some of the things that you know that we've used Jupyter Notebooks for to help run Adafruit? Well, we use, data, use Jupyter Notebooks, actually we use it in a couple ways. So we use it in part of the business to do like modeling. So for example, um, we're gonna start giving away um, trinkets you know, with, with mm -hmm. orders. And we're gonna give it with, away with orders over like, you know, $150 or something. Right. So we want to know how many we have to make. And so we have to model our sales history, our sales forecast, mm -hmm. and how many we'll need and like how often we're gonna need to make them. So that's, a, a, you know, data analysis where we take previous data and then look at sales growth and then, you know, model this future sales growth and then we'll graph 
how many we need so we can say like, How would okay. you do that before? Or how do people, like MATLAB or like, how would you do that? We would, you know, actually. How, how would someone do that? <laughs> we would actually probably look at the data and sort of like gut check it and just say like, well, I think it's going to be about this. We just look at like, here's how many we sold last year and we just approximate. Yeah, but sort it's, of like a combination of yeah. like a spreadsheet type thing we with some gut Excel. check. And, yeah, yeah, maybe Excel and some, and then we just, we just do a rough multiply. We say, okay, multiply everything by like a 5% growth mm -hmm. or something. Um, but now it's just easier to do that because we can uh, query, we have a replication database. So we, we have a main database, which we use for our orders, and we have a replication database, which has no customer user info. It just has like the sales. Mm -hmm. So we can um, query it to get like information about like, well, how, without, you know, without giving people access to the main database, they have like this data set that they can use. So our Jupyter Notebook actually can query that. Right. We have, we have permission, you know, we basically we did a secure uh, connection, so you can run queries directly from right. um, Python, and you can like very quickly like look at the data and see if it makes sense. So that's like one example of how we would use it well, in the store. What's nice is then you also have the same reports month to month that look oh, very yeah. similar. You can you know download them as PDFs. You can post them as HTML. So it's very flexible that way too. Yeah, and we also share the the notebook. So like you know we have different people working on it, and they're like you know instead of Instead of like the standard way that like business development goes where it's like, can you run it but with 10% growth and then like, you know, two days later they run it and they repeat, the person can just go into the notebook right. and, and, you know, tweak the number and rerun it right. um, without, without having to like pass around like report.final, report.final, final, report.modified by Alicia, you know what I mean? Like it, yeah. it's, it, it lives on the central server. So that's kind of a, a way that we use it. And then I use it for um, like data analysis. So like I was, I'm doing a, I have this thermal camera and I was trying to do like a bicubic, um, uh, uh, what's it called, filter on it. Uh -huh. And instead of writing all my code in C and just running it over and over again with like different, um, like tw you tweak the numbers a little bit to like, uh, like how much you want the filter to to be across like you know do you want mm -hmm. 20 by 20 or 13 by 13 or whatever instead of running that multiple times on the data what i did was i just dumped the data from the microcontroller uploaded it to jupyter notebook and then i ran all my calculations and then simulated the tft and nice. what it would look like so i could try like different like color ranges and stuff and see like what looks good did you play with scikit image i haven't tried that scikit like, image is like a 2D. machine learning um library just for images so you could use it to like separate you can use it to like adjust photos and things like that but then you could also use it for like mri um, scans mm -hmm. and isolating different portions on like an x-ray or, or a scan or you know it, and it tends to be something that's fun like images tend to be a really fun thing to work with for new folks to python yeah also, you can like grab data from your microcontroller and then you put in Python, like do a fast Fourier transform. And you oh, can yeah. Look, like, that's like, I that's wish just, we so had easy. that yeah. when I was going through my electrical engineering. Like, you don't want to do that on the microcontroller, so you just grab the data, but then it's very easy and it graphs for you. And then yep. you can, do, I do different filters. Yep. So, like, I'll grab the data and then I'm like, okay, I see like what I want there. And then I'll try different um, digital filters and Absolutely. I'll try each one. Like, okay, I'll try a black man and I'll try like a windowed sink and then whichever one looks best, then I'll go back and implement it. Cool. So um, you may have covered this, but it was a follow-up question. So what's yeah. Jupyter Hub? Jupyter Hub. Um, Jupyter Hub is actually a project that I work on and um, it is basically a way to give um, Jupyter notebooks to students or a group of people to give each person a notebook, but the person doesn't have to install anything on their computer. As long as they have a web browser, they can do everything through the browser. And what's really nice is like we have a class at UC Berkeley that just started. There's 1,200 students in the one class, which is an awfully big lecture, Whoa. but um, they're all running on Jupyter Hub. And so it doesn't matter whether you have a top of the line laptop or a Chromebook, you can still all have the same resources because Jupyter Hub is serving it to you over the web. And it was really interesting, like at MIT, you know, we had Athena clusters. Exactly. Had, right. And so the idea was even when I went, people didn't have very good computers. Yeah. So you'd have to go to the cluster if you wanted to. Like we would actually say, oh, I have to run a simulation. I have to like walk to building four yep. and log into like the SunSpark station or like the SGI or whatever to yep. run my 
3D visualization and then I'll take it and put it in my report. But now actually they're getting rid of the clusters because people can just use cloud computing. Exactly. So like you would, instead of walking over to run this ma- like huge mathematical calculation, you just do, do it on Jupyter Hub and then it would, does it run like EC2 in the background? Is it like a cloud computing? Like how does it? it, it, it you could run it as a cloud in the background mm-hmm. or you can run Jupyter Hub on bare metal. Yeah. Um, so there's different ways you can deploy it. But yeah. What it really does. I imagine, does, like, why why pay for hardware where it's like, exactly. if you're just going there to just run this software, just run it through the browser. Yeah. And I mean, supercomputer centers are running Jupyter Hub as well so that their researchers can, you know, although they've traditionally done batch jobs, they can have that interactive prototyping. And, you know, so people are using it for like Hubble Space Telescope stuff. And oh, yeah. Such a good idea. It's, I can imagine now it's you say, like, look, I need a lot of computational power. You're like, I'll pay a little bit more to get more, more, more. Right. And so, or you can say, oh, I don't care how long it takes and let it run overnight. Oh, what was the image manipulation tool that you were talking about? Um, it's called SciKit Image, so S-C-I-K-I-T dash image. Okay. Oh, SciKit. We have helpers in the chat, and we will post up some links. Okay, but cool. Th- yeah. Th- there's a few people that are um, doing a lot of cool stuff with Python and hardware. We'll get to that soon. And it looks like a lot of people in the science and data world are using Jupyter Notebooks. Now. Yeah. So I'm going to put you on the spot for one question. No. Relevant to Adafruit. So we have an Ada, Ada logger. It's an mm-hmm. Adafruit data logger. Yeah. Um, on the walk over here, we we're thinking it might be neat to do some type of like Jupyter hardware thing where it was it's optimized for people that use Jupyter notebooks and are doing data logging. So maybe it's like a circuit Python-y right. thing. With, maybe we'll talk after the show. Yeah. And you could tell us like what we would need to do to make the hardware work even better with Jupyter notebook. notebook. Yeah. Well, like Tony D, um, a number of months back, did like a Jupyter kernel for CircuitPython, there was a video that he did about that. And I've also wrote, written um, a rudimentary kernel so that you could communicate with CircuitPython running and, and then actually interface with the board running CircuitPython using the notebooks. Mm. Oh, gotcha. um, but you know, there's still some tweaking that needs to go on with that. But yeah, I mean, that's something that I would love to see. Yeah, because we're, we're building a lot of stuff that it only works with browsers. Um, Maybe the computers aren't so great at schools, right? But they want to do data logging. Jupyter Notebook seems like it's going to be something that they use from the software side. On the hardware side, right. we wanted to have something. Okay, so we'll talk yeah. afterwards. Yeah, well, definitely. So that's a, It's not out yet. <laughs> Don't ask. But but, that was but, the but we really want to do it. And if you develop it yourself, let us know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, who are the folks behind the Jupyter project? Who are the folks behind the Jupyter project? You have this nice slide. You know, there's a small group of us. Um, We're actually an academic research project and um, with a few industry partners that um, share some engineers with us. But um, most of us come out of the academic world. Um, UC Berkeley and Cal Poly, as well as um, some other places in Europe. And um, we're just a team that likes spreading great programming tools for scientific reproducibility and education and data science. And we've been very fortunate to have three very wonderful grant funders that fund most of our stuff. And, you know, you could find more information about them on our website. But, um, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, there were some hardware questions. So, um, speaking of Python, yeah, let's just just jump to it. So, Python for hardware, it's here. It's here. And you've been um, helping us in some of the repos and, and doing hardware testing and stuff for us. Yep. So that's nice. What Thank is CircuitPython was the first question in one of the chats today. Wow. Well, I can answer that one. CircuitPython is um, a derivative of MicroPython, which is by Damien George. And we, we sell MicroPython boards, too. CircuitPython is um, designed to run on the SAMD hardware. And it has a, a simplified digital interface API. So you can interface with hardware very easily. And it's kind of designed to make hardware programming as easy as possible. So just like Arduino is disruptive to using a C compiler and like burning with AVR dude, mm-hmm. um, CircuitPython makes it even easier. It's like you said, it's a digital camera compared to a film camera. You yep. can program directly on the board. It runs the Python interpreter native, so you don't need any extra software. Uh, it helps if you have glitter nail polish, but it's not necessary. <laughs> Um, this is the, the Trinket M0 board that we just finished on Friday. So it's we have, beautiful. We have a family of boards. Uh, we have the, the Trinket, the Metro, um, the Feather Express. And so we have the Metro, which is kind of a bigger, like Arduino classic shaped it. hardware. Yeah, you can, oh, you can show it on the overhead. 
and um, it's Arduino shaped and it has this um, SPI flash chip. So you actually store your code on a two megabyte hard drive that appears when you when you plug it in. What's really neat is you can take your hardware with you, right? Um, which is sweet. It's like it's a like GitHub but physical, or not GitHub, but it's a, yeah, it's a GitHub but physical. You commit your code here. And um, you can program it through the USB interface, but you have access to Python, including a REPL. So you right. can, if you want to write code, you can write code in a text file, or if you want to write code just by like playing around in, in the evaluation loop. Mm -hmm. I think that's also kind of interesting. So you get a disk drive and a serial REPL. And then we have um, CircuitPython. That's on, my favorite. On the um, Express. <laughs> Like that's Frankenstein board. This is a Frankenstein board. Uh, I write Frankenstein because um, this is when I change when I when I test different hardware. Like I got a different speaker and I wanted to test it. Oh, okay. I, I removed this cool. and, and and saw what the difference is or heard the difference. But this one also, you know, has alligator clips. You have some alligator clips here, so you can. Um, this is meant for like wearables or like people who are like they don't even want to solder or use wires or breadboards. They just want to clip parts directly. Well, and as somebody who's taught wearable electronics workshops to. Yeah. Um, you know, young folks and old folks. Um, it's really nice to have everything on the board because you can teach a lot more yeah. and not have to be sewing or, you know, using copper tape or wire. And yeah. so I think, you know, you can teach people the basics all on one board. It really makes it a lot more affordable and also, um, you get to the fun stuff a lot faster. Yeah. This one has like two buttons, a switch, accelerometer with three axis, a light sensor, a temperature sensor, um, a speaker that can do like little audio clips, um, a microphone, and it has um, infrared receive and transmit, as well as 10 uh, NeoPixel LEDs and all the alligator clips and the, you know, battery plug, you can plug in your battery and stuff. Um, so you get like, you know, full color LEDs and, and a lot of sensors and stuff. And yeah, it's meant to be, um, you plug it in and it's like $25 and it does everything. You don't, you know, you can add more hardware, but you don't have to. Right. If you don't want to, it has it has enough to do like probably like fifty or sixty different projects. Oh, probably more than that. Yeah, like, Keep I up think with people, more projects. Yeah. And then, um, like a month ago, we brought out the Gemma. So the Gemma is just a smaller and lower cost version, and it only has one um, RGB LED, and it doesn't have the two megabyte storage. Instead, the this, this storage is just on chips, so you get about sixty four k of storage, which is enough to yeah. still do quite a bit. Um, like I, I tried out, you can run three hundred NeoPixels from it. Three hundred? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, you can run. You can run That's pretty good. awesome. Yeah, there, there's a lot of memory uh, Whoa. left over. It's very optimized. So but there's one thing that, too yeah. that it's been interesting watching Lady Ada and, and Scott and the entire team doing stuff with um, Circuit Playground because there's another group of people out there that love electronics but don't know how to code, and it was the cosplay world, and they have lots of blinky things on their costumes and then when they're at the cosplay events they might not have a com computer with them because in the past you'd have to download the software right you'd have to change stuff you'd have to compile it right. but um, one of the cool features about all these you plug in and it shows up as a USB drive and you can change a line of text and now your glowing whatever um, costume item right. is changing and it's neat because something that you just mentioned about Jupyter Notebooks where it's a lot of it's interpretive language, so you can do a lot of stuff real time, mm -hmm. and you don't have to like, okay, it's compile time, let's go get a sandwich. Um, same thing for hardware. In the past, you'd always have to compile and wait. And I think a lot of people collectively probably spent years just waiting for something to compile, transferring it to the microcontroller. Okay, it didn't work. Rinse and repeat. It makes it like more fun. Like I actually enjoy writing Python code. Another thing that's nice is because the Python language has so much built into it, that you know with Arduino you're like oh I have to like figure out some like parsing thing and I have to include that or like um, like managing strings and arrays and lists is, is annoying but on Python it's all built in yeah it is so like so there's like like simple things like just formatting like printout data or like um, like iterating over like you know I, I want to filter over an entire list it's like very very easy to do yeah and I think there's also over the years been a lot of emphasis with Core Python um, to have really good documentation, both posted on the website, but also documentation that if you make an error while you're coding, that yeah. it kind of gives you some guidance as to how to correct that error. Yeah, like not like syntax error. <laughs> yeah, <Line eight. laughs> something a little more helpful than that, hopefully. So Bill um, is in the chat. He runs AT Makers, Assistive Technology Makers. Okay, cool. And he said one of the cool things about 
using Python, CircuitPython, is he can send the code to a parent, and maybe this is something that's helping them run, run their wheelchair or buttons right. or, or something, and there's no software. Right. They can just toss it on there, and he's like, downloading software is kind of a deal breaker. There might not be technology right. um, and if enthusiasts. And there's like drivers. It and can be so complicated. It's very minor things, and uh, he does a lot of great videos, and you can see the impact it has in people's lives. And you don't really think about, oh, compiled versus interpreted of what it can actually mean in the real world. And he does that every day. So well, yeah, yeah and like, like accessi <laughs> accessibility and assistive technologies. I mean, there's so many cool things you could do, like with music, Music 21, which is a music theory library. You can actually convert sheet music to Braille. Yeah. And Amory Thomas, um, who wrote that great oh, yeah. book on making makers, um, who's a uh, mechanical engineering professor at University of St. Thomas, she has students that are um, visualizing music and teaching music to people that perhaps don't uh, like have hearing, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Limitations? Yes. Yeah. And it's really cool to watch like a whole classroom of students that have those limitations be able to enjoy music from you know the sounds and the vibrations yeah. like the vibrations that the sounds cause and um so there's really cool work being done and i think the same thing like python with 3d printing and i mean it's so many different ways you could go with these yeah i think like as the chips get more powerful so like you know this this family of chips that we're using this this cortex m0 and then you know, the cortex m4 series coming out really soon that we're we're going to hopefully get early access to is it's like you have so many cycles like it's it's free basically mm -hmm. so you might as well instead of just trying to make things more intense make things easier right right like it's like if you have the memory and the space to do an interpreted language my view is like we should totally go with the interpreted language and like right now it's a little bit sluggish on the m0 but i know that the chips are only gonna get faster and cheaper like there's only one way that's gonna move right and then you also have to balance it against like okay there might be another language that's a little faster but if it takes me three times as long to learn how to code in that language yeah you know that's time that you could have been spending developing stuff yeah. And enjoying it. I think one of the things, you know, I don't know if you took 6001, but, um, but like, I, I TA'd it, and it's very close to my heart. Yeah. It's amazing how we could teach so much in one semester. Like, yep. all of, basically, the entirety of introductory computer science. Right. In one semester. And what's interesting is, um, because I, like, took it three times, so I took it, and then, like, I TA'd <laughs> it twice. You know, and, like, by the third time, you're like, you really get it. It's, what's brilliant about it was that the language they picked, which was Scheme, which was, right. Python didn't exist at the time, so they, right. they picked Scheme. Because we weren't dealing with, like, memory and pointers and, like, the syntax, there was a little bit of syntax, but not so much. Right. We were able to say, like, okay, we're going to, like, teach, like, tree mapping and, like, searching and, like, sorting. And, like, we could do it in, like, 20 minutes. Right. Whereas trying to do it in, in C or C++ or compiled language would have been such a nightmare but because Scheme is also interpreted, right? You right. run it and you'd have a REPL. It made it like so fast and easy. And that's kind of like what I like about Python is you, you're stripping away the, the parts that aren't necessary. Right. That you can get to, look, if you want to like do your own memory management, go for it. You can do that later. But right. Why deal with pointers well, and, and that's like, string like length? Go, you know what I mean? Like go and rust in some ways is an easier way to get into some of the stuff that you know C or C++ would have been used for because you don't have to deal with the pointers and the memory management. Like I don't need cycle by cycle. I mean yes, like sometimes you want cycle by cycle, but if you don't need cycle by cycle, you often don't. Yeah. Like why? Well, I think the other thing is like what we learned with Scheme and also with Python is you actually learn more about what data means and yeah. how to write good code that is sort of language agnostic. You know, it's like, okay, data looks like this, what do I do with it? And it's more on a conceptual level. It's I think computational really, thinking. Yeah. Not just like, oh, I have to put my semicolons in the right Exactly. Place. And one question came up, um, and Lamar or Carol, you can answer it. So uh, there's something called a REPL with mm -hmm. what we do, and that kind of gives you real-time programming on top of the interpretive stuff. What is the REPL? What is the REPL? Um, it's read, evaluation, print loop. Which, which comes from Lisp. 
Yes, it does actually come from Lisp. I love which, this. I love how we're really like getting the, the Lisp. Python which was what we used along with C when I was at MIT. And um, so as much as things change, it doesn't really change that much. But um, yeah, I mean, the REPL lets you um, type in a line of code. The interpreter will read that line of code. It will execute the line of code, print it out to you on the screen, and then loop to a new prompt where you would type another line of code and go yeah. through. So you can just like type in, you know, like print hello world, and it will actually just print hello world. You don't right. have to like get an entire, you don't have to program and upload or whatever. Like you rapid, just, rapid prototype. Very, very rapid. I watched yeah. Lamar take game of life code from the Arduino world and like toss it in and line by line in the REPL change it and then put it in, uh, we're using the Moo editor. Oh yeah. Hit save, our board automatically runs it and like over the course of like 10 minutes, uh, it was like watching um, someone with one of those tennis ball machines like just rapid ball. fire yeah them. it was like boom boom no because I would I'd upload yeah. code but then I would quickly jump to the REPL and be like let me try this because you know I have to remember my pen like oh how do I reverse right. a list or like how do you know how does this how am I going to do this so I do it in a REPL I'd be like okay you know just taking my data and like figuring it out and then saying fine and then put it in the main code and then rerunning it and then doing that piece by piece as something broke I would pull that part out of the code mm -hmm. and just try it on the REPL yeah different yeah different tricks and, and tips without having to run the whole thing over again right and and the notebooks actually came out of um, something called IPython which was a um, REPL designed for Python that had more features that scientists or researchers would use. Yeah. And so that interactive component comes from that original Python REPL mm -hmm. and has evolved into um, what we consider the notebook today. Yeah. Neat. OK, so yeah. folks are asking, um, so we have a new trinket. Yeah. Ooh. You want to show this off? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. This is the trinket. Dun, dun, dun. It's so small. It's yeah. so small. It's so you, you looked at it, you're like, this is too small. So this is it's the... It's thin, too. It's Yeah, I used the skinny PCB. So this is um, the AtSMD. It's the same processor, basically, in this, as these. Yeah, totally. But it's just this. It does fewer pins, but that's okay. And you have five GPIOs. Yeah, there's a quarter. So Jim is a little bit bigger than a quarter. And yeah, then uh, I think it's kind of like the same, same size. And then it's got like a reset button. It has an RGB LED. I'm actually going to um, Ooh, fire it up. In. I can plug yeah. it in. Neat. So it's actually running a little Python program right now that just changes the RGB LED. Like you just, you know, from we red. Oh, yeah. to our board so you can do projects even just with the board. You can start. Yeah. Okay, it's working. Yeah, no, that's, that's fun. People like colors. Yeah. And it's like a, it's, it um, gives you like a feedback on your REPL if you're, if you're doing it. But it's also, um, it's fun to like just write code and you have immediately something to run oh, with. Quick question. Is it the same thickness? Um, as the new Gemma, because this is yeah, a this board. is half half thickness. So when you have a bigger board and you need stability, I use a full thickness. But then the Gemma and the Trinket are um, thinner. So this is a 0.8 millimeters, I think. Yeah, it's tiny, super skinny. So very very slim, and the micro SD makes it even skinnier. And for wearables, I yeah, mean, it'd be good. really cool because it doesn't really add any weight. Like the battery yeah. would add more weight than. Yeah, we board. have super skinny batteries, too. Yeah, I know, you do. This one is a pretty chunky one that I keep around. But we have ones that are even smaller. And the, the chip is um, pretty low power, too. You know, it's, it's a ARM Cortex-M0. So even though it's pretty powerful, it's running at 40 megahertz, it uh, doesn't use more than the AVRs. And it's a little bit more expensive. So the, the t trinket's a, a teeny bit more. It's like $2 more. Because the chip costs two dollars, not a dollar. So I, if I use this in a wearable, like, would I get through an evening party or something? Yeah, sure. Yeah, or like a million cosplay will last thing. For a while. The the LEDs are going to take the power. Oh, now, yeah, yeah. Not the board. Um, this is comparison. I mean, like, it, it doesn't seem like much, but there's some chips that we've used that um, they are like like a Raspberry Pi is is a very power hungry right. chip. It's right. a full length computer and it runs Python, but you know it, it draws like a hundred milliamps all the time. And this is like five. And you told me before, and now I forgot how many NeoPixels this okay. could support. These can support 300, which is which is a lot. A memory. lot, yeah. And that's with um, brightness control. If you turn off the brightness control, like we automatically, the reason is is that when we um, when you set the brightness in the library before we write out the pixels, we basically 
uh, make a copy of the array and right. adjust it by the brightness and then write it out. Right. We want to make it more user friendly. Right. Um, if you turn that off, you can do like 500 or 600. Holy moly. Yes, this is a smaller battery. So this is like our little. Oh, that's a nice one. So yes, yeah, so this one would be the, a good one to match with. This about the same size. It is. Yeah, it's so cute. Totally the and same size. And then you size. can connect. There's a little spot you can solder a connector. This one is meant to be used on a breadboard, or you can just like solder wires. This one is best with alligator clips. Hmm. But you can solder to it too. But people like it for like alligator clips. So you can just like, clip, hey. Is there a little tiny mini display that would go with that? Um, we have a little OLED display. It doesn't wouldn't go on top, but you could you could next put it next to it. To it. Yeah. yeah. I have a demo I can I can probably grab later. I can show you. Sweet. And then I'm actually working on the tester today. I thought I'd just show this even though. Yeah, the tester is really running cool. Trinket. It's not it's not running Python, but then um, I'll reset it. Hold on. So uh, you, you want to stick it on there? Yeah. So this is a little Teensy with an SD card for the file system stuff, and um, it can program a, a trinket in about five and a half seconds. So that program final, that's when it actually writes the entire Python plus file system, 256k. So when you plug it in now, you can see it's running that demo. It, it writes everything like the, the yeah, Python core that's and, awesome. and the um, files. And when you plug it in, it gives it a little readme. Right. So you can like read, you know, here's where you go for, for right. tutorials and stuff, which I think is fun. And I also put the driver on here. So when you plug it in, it, you, like, you don't have to search for the Windows driver. Oh, if nice. Running, if you're running Windows that's 7. That's nice if you're running Windows, yeah. Yeah, Windows 7, it's like, that's the last one where they didn't have um, So support. Windows 10, you don't need yeah. the driver. Here's yeah. a good question. Yeah. Will CircuitPython code consume more power than Arduino code? No, it won't because you know the the Arduino code doesn't. With these chips, it's not like, like it's always running something. Mm -hmm. Like the you know in Arduino, even if you're not running, you're in a delay loop and it doesn't go to sleep. So it's actually about the same amount of power. Right. You only the only power that comes in is pretty much from peripherals or um, anything you connect to it. Like the unless you go to sleep, but like we, if you connect a motor. Or yeah, a, the motor is what is going to draw the power. Servo and or something. In Arduino land, you can go to sleep. There's sleep modes. We don't have sleep modes in Py Circuit Python yet, but we're not sure people really need them because you kind of want to have the USB always running. Right. So I don't know if it makes sense to use this ultra sleep mode, but we might we might look into it for you know people who want to like not connect it to USB. It would go to sleep. Okay. Next question: um, <laughs> Are they all 3.3 volts now? Yep, all of them run three volts. Um, uh, you know, we've actually had a couple three volt only boards, and people seem to be okay with it. They, there's not a lot of stuff these days that is five volts. So most sensors are three volts. Right. And the few that aren't, um, we'll probably show how to wire them up. Like it, like these character LCDs, you power them from five volts, but the logic is three volts. Yeah, and then that, you just do a or like a level shifter or something. Yeah. But okay. honestly, pretty much everything's three volts. For the days. Trinket M zero, um, would you be able to use feather wings with it, or would you just use like feathers? You would probably use a feather just because it's so big. Um, you could wire up feather wings, um, but our feather uh, express runs Python and it gets you that extra disk space. And it's not that much more expensive, but you get much more with it. So I would recommend just going with the Feather. Okay. Do you want to go into a bunch of voltage questions? Because people want voltage Sure, questions. we can ask them. Okay. Sure. So um, is there any Adafruit products that will help folks transition from the 5-volt world to the 3.3-volt world? Is that a possibility? You don't really need it. I mean, honestly, almost everything you do will probably just run fine at 3 volts. Like, yeah. there's very okay. few things that don't. And then um, how does a 3.3-volt board affect using 5-volt NeoPixels? With the, well, we don't have World Semi chips anymore. We use the SK chips, and those are, because uh, they don't break as often. And the SK chips are very happy with 3-volt logic, so you just give the NeoPixels 5-volt power, and then you Then it just logic. reduces it. Yeah, no, yeah. the first chip oh. will automatically mm -hmm. uh, yep. raise it. So, like, you only have to talk to the first chip. Right. And um, we've never had a problem talking to the first chip with 3.3 volts. It's, it's not an issue. Okay. Uh, also, you can power um, NeoPixels from three volts, and they work fine. Like they're they're a little dimmer, but but they're awfully bright to begin they're with. They're awfully so. bright anyway, so <laughs> it's yeah, it's not even that much dimmer. Okay, folks are helping each other in the chat with suggestions on how they can build some of these project voltage regulators, all yep. sorts of stuff. Um, people have used NeoPixel rings with three point three volts. Works fine. Works fine. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Well, um, is there anything else you want to show about the trinket before we give away some trinkets? Data and no, I, I think it is just cool. It's just small. 
And we um, we sold out, but we have some that we Yeah, stashed. we're going to give some away. Also, the thing that Dangerous, I, I think that's that. neat is... Um, but you reset it from the coin. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. Hey, what do you do that for? Actually, yeah. That's right. I kept forgetting that it has the capacitive touch. Okay. <laughs> What's interesting is actually this has a capacitive touch when you touch um, Underneath. this pen. Underneath. See, it, it can you tell, can. and it um, the demo code is, is looking for pin four. I broke the trinket. You didn't break it. It's fine. No. <laughs> It's okay. These are kid tested. Um, <laughs> oh, good. Then they it's are, they're the Sam D suitable series for me. It's quite durable. I've actually not been able to really break into these Sam D chips, so that's that's a good. Can sign. we try later? You could absolutely. Go for um, it. So, uh, question about the tester, and then I'll um, yeah. ask something. So, what's the, cool. what's the part that is on the burner? Like, what's how does that like? What are the different pieces? This stuff. Yeah. This is the this is the driver. So this is a Teen C three six, and the reason I'm using a Teen C three six is it is the fastest microcontroller we stock that has USB host. So this is what, because I, I want to program this as fast as possible. And you can actually program the chip at like 50 megahertz um, or something ridiculous. So this is doing the SWD program of this chip and then it verifies it. And the firmware it writes is, is stored on this SD card. So it's actually just very convenient. It's like all in one. And then um, it drives this LCD, programs it, and then it uses this USB host to check the USB connection. So it actually does a, a full test to make sure it shows up as a USB device. And I like the very cool etched board too. Yeah, and this is other milled etched. So we made this on Friday. Like I was, we kind of got the prototype running on Wednesday and then we're like, okay, let's make a PCB and then we'll get final PCBs made that are like nice yeah. and, and then finished. Some, there are some educators that are just like, okay, like I want to buy these anyways. Well, you have a 10% off right now. Um, I extended the code. So this will be up till Sunday night. You could use Trinket Party to get 10% off anything we have in stock. Um, I have an observation about how you design testers that I think is neat. Empathy testers. So uh, Lady Ada sits 15 feet from the pick and place machines and from a lot of the staff here. And so she sees the people testing and she's one of the people who does the testing. And if we can get it down to five seconds instead of two minutes, that's lives <laughs> like yeah. for each minute. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so that's one of the things that if we see um, or when we have our uh, multiple staff meetings throughout the week, if there's any ways that we can optimize testing, we do it. Even if it's a few seconds, it, it adds up, especially after 10,000 trinkets. Yeah, the previous the previous tester was a full Raspberry Pi. Um, I can I can grab and, and show it in a second. And um, it used Linux to program it, and it was it took about 15 seconds, which is fine. But just adding the Raspberry Pi, it's complexity because you have to wait for it to boot up. And then sometimes like things get like weird and like crashy. Like it's just it's just Linux, and like you know if, if somebody like plugged or shorted something that the Linux board can hang and so people would have to reboot it when this is a completely solid state. I like that. Well, and, and it's it also, faster. it's also really cool. Like you do really extensive testing on every single board. Oh yeah, no, this is like super testing. Which yeah, is really test. amazing because not everybody does that. Yeah, and you can do optical inspection, but then you should still do full test inspection. Yeah. And if you don't, um, you can ship out tens of thousands and it doesn't, um, it doesn't work out. Oh, cool! On yeah, our um, on our Instagram and I think on our our Twitters and on our site, we've oh we've, nice. We've posted lots of pictures of our testers. We think they're beautiful. Um, we have a weird sense of beauty, but that's okay. Um, so we have a lot of the stuff that we use to make the testers in our yeah. store too. There's a lot of companies that use our stuff for their own testers. I can put this up. So you can look at some of our tester videos. I think there's probably a three or four where Lady Ada shows how we make testers. And then when she finds cool things like the USB cable that has an on and off switch. Can I live here forever? Yay! Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I have a card for you. I have a, so you can get in. Yeah. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Sweet. <laughs> Speaking of. Oh, All look right. at that. Booting up there. Yeah, so it's like, you know, it boots up and it's like ready to go. And then, um, hold on, let me get this trinket and I can show. It's it's very similar, uh, but it's just it just runs this. Oh, uh, the, the person wanted to know what had the SD card in it. That was our... That's um, the that's Teensy. Teensy, yeah. Teensy. So you can see it, it programs it. It just takes a little bit longer uh, just because there's like Linux overhead and you have to like do Linux things. Oh, kernel? Yeah, it's just, you know, it's it also like... Um, yeah, so it takes like... Oh, 16 seconds? 16 seconds. But it makes you know, So you can do three in the time that you yeah, could do one. And do one. And also it's, it's just more durable, yeah. I think, to have it be... Um, you know, get all in one solid state. Oh yeah. You know, no, one of the things no you don't hear about operating system in electronic manufacturing is about the testers. It's like not only is no one talking about it, but they don't want to share how they do it for two reasons usually. One, it, they did a really good job, and they don't want to share, or they do a terrible job and they don't want to share. That it just takes so much time. 
to test mm -hmm. a board. Well, and building the right fixtures for testing, you know, when you're prototyping and building like projects for eventually production, those those fixtures really make life much easier mm -hmm. because other people can build it. Yeah. yeah, this is completely like I made the first one and then um, the team here makes the rest. But having, you know, and just having something where it's like super durable and easy because there's people who come here and this is like the first time they've done it. We have to make it like so easy to test that they'll test each one. It right. sounds like silly, but actually, you know, some people ask like, how do you know that you test each one? I'm like, well, like you have to, right? But, right. but there's actually sometimes that happens in, in companies or like if you do contract manufacturing, they don't actually test the boards. No, they, they don't. They say they do and they don't. And so I've it, gotten some of those boards before. I've yeah, got, I've gotten some Kickstarters like that. They're like, well, we don't have time to, to test them, but we, <laughs> yeah, the, the factory said they're good. Yeah, yeah. So up. like having having it be so easy and like simple to do is like I think really important because if it is an onerous test, I think people have they have more incentive to skip it. But if it's fast, they're like, well, okay, if it only takes five seconds, it's not a big deal. But if a test takes two minutes, I could see why people are like, oh no, you don't want to skip it. Or if you have to like run software. You know, there's sometimes you have testers where you actually have to like type and like run commands, and that's right. that usually things Those get messed. Are, that's where error gets involved. Error gets involved. Stuff. This I like because it's like press this button to test and this button to shut down. Like you just press the button. Like there's not. Well, and these are so small, you could stick like five, six, ten in a row you can. and test a whole bunch at once. Yeah, somebody was asking, you know, why don't we have one, you know, panel where it tests multiple, but I think I'm not, I don't really like that because I like to know if one fails, which one it is. So I'd rather well, yeah, do one at a like, time and be multiples. Yeah, like same, like same, like make three of these and test three, but not on the same tester. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Cool. Okay, so um, let's give away a trinket. Let's Woo! give away some trinkets. Yeah, so this is the trinket. Hooray. Do we have it? Oh, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's hiding it's underneath it. Yeah, it's programming. It's programmed. It's, it's definitely tested. This time it took 15.62 seconds. It depends a little bit because, you know, it mounts the USB drive. It's, it, it's like there's... It's how fast. Yeah. I like whatever Linux is doing, whatever delay. Yeah. Also, like sometimes USB just it doesn't, it just doesn't memory immediately. I'm not 100% sure why it doesn't happen exactly the same amount of time. Linux is 26 years old. And you know because <laughs> every year someone tweets out the, or in the past they would email it, it's like, happy birthday, and they have a picture of all the ingredients. Go compile the cake yourself. It's funny. Yeah. yeah it's like, here's, here's an egg and some milk. Well, I remember Linux before it had any graphical installers and, like, early, early, early. Yeah. Like, menu config is, like, fancy. Yes. Okay. Free so BSD, you still have, like, a text file. You just yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. You'd have to, <laughs> so here's great. how we're going to do the giveaway. Okay. We're going to make this fun. So here's the rules. We're going to put up a phone number. You can call it. Whoever calls in, uh, Lady Eight is going to ask you a uh, name. You can use whatever name you want, um, where you're from, you say whatever you want, but what you're going to build with the trinket. Yeah, just give us some unique identifier for you. Yeah, and then, we'll, um, and then you'll email us and we'll, we'll send yeah. you that one. Okay, okay. you want to start this up? Yeah. Okay. Sweet. The phone lines are open. Okay, call this number and I'm going to give you a free trinket. Yeah. Oh, the phone lines are almost open. Is the Ada fruit? 3D printed thing? New? I don't know. I think this one on my desk. And then so took the it from my phone desk. number is own bit stab. Yeah, I need to get from my desk. Cool. Yeah, call this number. Yeah. It's gonna ring. Whoa! Oh, that was fast. Yeah. Yeah, they're we're on speed dial now. Okay, ready? Yeah, go yeah. for it. Hello, you've reached the Adafruit giveaway and you're the winner. Congratulations. What's your name and where are you calling from? I'm Scott and calling from Newport Beach, Florida. Wow, awesome. Congratulations, Scott from Florida. You won a Trinket M0 with CircuitPython. Amazing. What are you going to build with it? Well, actually, I'm trying to figure out uh, how to build something for my cat. that actually has seizures once in a while. So okay. I'll notify me when it gets in bad shape. Okay, <laughs> yeah, you should. Oh, that's nice. You have a sensor on your cat. Tell us about your cat. Is a sensor to cats get seizures? Yeah. yeah. Um, and this will notify So this yeah. is a, oh, yeah. Nice. Yeah, it's nice and small. So great idea. Yeah. Small. That's a very good Open idea. source it. Other people would probably okay. want it. Well, congratulations. Yes, but I, know, I know like five cats with seizures. I yeah. know, seizures, they cat would, seizures. They, yeah. would, they would probably benefit from that. Yeah. Hello? Uh, yeah, hi. Sorry. Yeah. Stop distracting me, you two. Uh, sorry, Scott. Uh, they're distracting me. Um, you can email support at adafruit.com and we're going to give you a free trinket. M0, just tell them you've won a product number 3500 and you're Scott from Florida. 
Alright, thank okay. you very much. Thanks, goodbye. We're going to keep doing this. Yes. As soon as you put it down, if it I put it down. Yeah. Okay, the next, are still next open. caller will also win. We're going to give away three, right? However many you want to give away. Oh, three's good. I like the fact that it's 3500. Zero, zero. Yeah, no, I kind of like, I kind of grabbed that one. When that, that number comes up, I'm like, okay, it's available. Okay, I'm going to nice. the next one. Ready? Yeah. Second ring. Go Ready? for it. Two rings. Hello, you've reached the Adafruit giveaway line. You're a winner. What's your name and where are you calling from? Hi, my name's Ryan. I'm calling from Logan, Utah. Wow. Okay, hi, Ryan from Logan, Utah. You're a winner of a Trinket M0. Congratulations. Wow, amazing. What are you going to do with it? I'd like to build a simplified thermometer for my kids' preschool. Ooh. So with, um, kids preschool with NeoPixels and Neopixels. to break up the temperature into 10-degree nice. increments. Ooh. So it's easy for little yeah. kids to read. That's a good idea. All right, awesome. Well, the Trinket and Jewel will do an excellent job with that because it can drive 300 NeoPixels and <laughs> blind all the children with colorful glory. No, that, I mean, they all have those solar they, eclipse, they eclipse glasses. glasses. No, yeah, they have the solar eclipse glasses. They double as Neopixel glasses. glasses. Uh, yeah. So, uh, congratulations. You're the winner. Email support at Adafruit and say, hey, it's Scott from Utah. And, uh, sorry, no, not Scott. You're, sorry, what was your Ryan. name? Ryan. 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 Sorry, the last guy was Scott. You're Ryan. Ryan from Utah, and you're the winner of a product number 3500, and we're going to send you one immediately. Yeah. Support at Adafruit.com. Thank you so Support much. Adafruit. Thanks, Ryan. Okay, thanks. Bye. Okay, we're going to give away another. We might one have more. to reboot you. I know. I can't. I, you usually only do one winner, so I don't have to keep that many names. Yeah. <laughs> Ship numbers I can keep. So far, it was Florida, Utah, cat seizures, preschool kids stuff. Okay. Let's see what's on the phone Do you want to do this one? No, you do okay, it. Fine. It's too much pressure. Hello. <laughs> Hello, this is the Adafruit giveaway line, and you're the winner. Congratulations. What's your name, and where are you calling from? Uh, it's Dana from Buffalo, New York. Okay, Dana, yeah, Dana New from York. Buffalo, New York. Uh, yeah, New York is awesome. We're in New York, too. Congratulations to the winner. What are you going to do with your free Trinket M0? Actually, I'm going to use this, I'm going to use this and start teaching my daughter how to program with MicroPython. Oh, yeah, that's an awesome idea. She's Perfect. Daughter to program MicroPython. Well, we've got and a lot of... Right. It's going to be whatever she picks. Whatever she wants to do. It'll probably be um, really bright NeoPixels because that's what kids love. Oh, those well, are awesome. Well, congratulations. <laughs> it's yours. Well, it has a little NeoPixel on it. So it's free. Email support at Adafruit and say... Crap, I forgot your name. What's your David. David from New York. <laughs> yeah, New York. So look, names yep. names are not my thing, okay? I, I can do code, but not names. Uh, Trust me, I'm the same way. Okay, not a problem. <laughs> Great. Well, you're identifier number one, and I'm identifier <laughs> number two. Okay, so email support at Adafruit, and say so you've won a product number 3500, and they're going to send you a trinket M0. Do you want to give away more? Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Thank, awesome. you. Thank you. All right, goodbye. Do you want to give one more? Well, we can do two more. We can do two more. Okay. Oh, that two would be more. fun. Trick it up zeros. All right. I, I need some. You somebody else remember the name for me? I'll please. remember the name, as so long you, as you say it out loud. Yeah. Just say if, when you say the name, we'll remember. Okay. Remember the name for me. I will. Yeah. Um, it's embarrassing. No, it's fine. As long as this is broadcast on the internet. <laughs> Hello, welcome to the Adafruit giveaway line. You're the winner of a free trinket M zero. Congratulations. What's your name and where are you calling from? Uh, my name's Mike uh, from California. Hey, Mike, Mike California. from California. Mike. Uh, congratulations, you're the winner of a Trinket M0. Uh, that's wonderful. What do you want to do with it? What are you going to build with this thing? Uh, I'm going to do an input device for uh, controlling uh, some of my uh, digital painting program. Oh, that's cool. Digital okay, it's so a digital painting input. Yeah, because it can do oh, keyboard nice. commands. Well, we've got example yeah, yeah, code yeah. for that. So this is perfect. Emails support at Adafruit and say, hey, it's Mike from California, and I'm going to build this digital input device, and uh, I'd like my free product number 3500, and they will send it to you immediately. I want to see the digital painting right, when he's you. Okay, done. sweet. Yeah. Bye. Right. That goes for California. everyone. Super email chill. us after you make these projects, too. Yeah, after you're done with these things, let us know. Then we can and show and tell. Show and tell them. Okay. I'm going to do one more. That's the last one. The last winner. Ooh. Here we go. Okay, Mike Ryan. Uh, we'll remember to say it out loud. Hello, and welcome to the Adafruit giveaway line. You are the winner of a free Trinket M0. Wow, amazing. Congratulations. What's your name, and where are you calling from? Hey, this is Ted from California. Go hey. Ahead. California. Hey, California. Ted from California. Well, hey, congratulations. You're a winner. What are you going to build with this free Trinket M0 we're going to send you? Like the previous gentleman, I'm going to teach my 15-year-old daughter how to program. Awesome. So what she to do. Yeah. Okay, whatever she wants to do with her programming, that's awesome. Well, I'm excited to send you a free Trinket M0. Uh, Ted from California, that's your name, right? I can remember that. Uh, email support at adafruit.com and say your name, where you're calling from, and uh, that you want a product number 3500, and that they will send you one immediately. 
Yay. Thank you so much. Of course. All right. Have a good day and hopefully post up your project that your daughter made. That would be awesome. We'd oh, that would be so cool. Yeah. Will do. All right. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Yeah, I want to see these projects. Okay. Tech from California, Mike from California, New York. Ryan, yeah, and if you didn't win, Scott, um, and we have whatever you have in stock, Utah. you can use Trinket Party, by the way. Worldwide. Yeah. Okay, right. I think I did that. You gave away all of them. Okay, we gave away five Trinket Zeros. Now we got to make more. I got to make more because actually that's all I all I have. <laughs> um, speed round. Okay, we had a couple people from Texas too, and they checked in. They're okay. There's um, Harvey's, uh, the hurricane there. Um, there was someone from uh, Outpost in that area and they said it's okay so um our thoughts are with you all hope you stay dry and thanks for checking in during <laughs> during this time yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. texas is pretty yeah. big if you're on west texas yeah. you're probably yeah you're probably no fine. they're at they're at one of the watch stations out oh really yeah yeah they're in austin okay. that's where we met we met in austin yeah we met in austin so okay with frogger with yes Fro yeah room with frogger and and yeah we will try to see other okay so we gave away all those uh trinket m zeros that's awesome uh is there more questions if there's any other questions, we can hit them in the chat. Um, yeah. But uh, you can hit, stick around in the Discord chat, of course. Um, we have a CircuitPython room, and we also have the live broadcast chat. Um, there's links in there. Um, shout out to Stella's helping out in the Discord chat and all the community members. Thanks, Stella. She's um, over there. Thank you, Stella. And you uh, I'll, I'll say this from you know, voice off the screen, um, but I'll, I'll stick in for a second. Um, thank you so much, Carol, for all the work you do. And you are very welcome. Thank you for all the work you guys do. Well, it, it, it's it's always good to see someone who gets what we do and why we're doing it. And there's also a completely other world education, Python, Jupiter, and we know how all these are going to come together. Like oh, we're yeah. working on our, our on our different things, but there's this common goal, and it's cool because we're we're able to contribute the hardware part. And Jupiter Notebooks, um, that's changed our business. And it uses Python, and nice. we have hardware that runs Python. Like it's, everything's finally coming together. It seems like the the cause and the value and the mission that we all collectively had is driving our our product development. But it's also driving uh, things that we have nothing to do with. It's just like, okay, cool, same team, yay! Absolutely. <laughs> so, so thank you for all, all your work. Your tweets are great too. It's always good to kind of get. Um, hour by hour at some of the events and conferences. Oh, nice. And uh, I also try and tweet out like when I'm traveling and I run into a student or someone who's created like a really cool thing, like a dress or light up dress yeah, or whatever. Yeah, retweet the heck out of you. It's time. always great because you guys always personally respond to. Well, that's how we know it's working the out. Person, too. yeah. Um, and I posted on the blog post when we announced that you were going to be here today. Um, your presentation, it's on SlideShare. Yep. It's excellent. If anyone wants Thank to you. get an overview of like Jupyter Notebooks, or even like your journey for programming. There's, there's another one up there that I did just two days ago about music and Jupyter, which folks might find fun too. Yeah, the title of your presentation was, or is, Python and Jupyter, your gateway for learning. Ooh. Yeah. See, now what we have to do is CircuitPython, oh, yeah. Trinket, and Jupyter, making cool stuff. Yeah, and it's also nice that you throw what you different in the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> hey, this is the yeah most accomplished electrical engineer that I have ever met. Aw. And I've been following you since you were in grad school writing blog posts on LadyAda.net website, and they were some of the best tutorials I have ever read Yay. about components and electronics things. I wish I had you when I was going through my double E program. I wish I had me going through my deli program too. Because <laughs> I really struggled with it. Well, it's funny. A lot of things at Adafruit. Um, when I talked to Lamar, she's like, "I wish I had this when I was going to school." So I'm going to do this at Adafruit, whether it be a part that we stock, or a tutorial, or code. It's like this would have saved me a lot of time. My favorite thing is we now stock um, this battery holder for Canon batteries. So when I was at the Media Lab, we used the Dimension 3D printer to 3D print like oh, a, yeah. a battery case for this. And it was like a month of work. It was because it, we had to model it, and like the 3D printer was really slow. You had to run oh, overnight, yeah. and it was like you had to get by time, and like you know you had to right, right, right. get time on it. And it's like it's like then I just like found it. I'm like, well, I don't think that makers really have that much of a use for it, but I was just so like angry that we spent a month designing this, and now you can just like buy it for two dollars. Well, and that's so, the beauty of open amazing. source because when I first started um, tinkering with like boards and embedded stuff. The development kits were thousands of dollars, oh and as God, a starving student, it, you couldn't. What's actually interesting is the the like the breakup boards that have come out from like Adafruit and SparkFun and Seed, but also like just like Chinese ones have actually 
push down the price of eval boards. I've noticed they're not as expensive as they used to be. Oh, yeah. Like eval boards for little chips and stuff, they used yeah. to be like $200, $300. Now they're 50 bucks, which is still right. expensive, but it's much more reasonable. It's much do more doable. Yeah. yeah. So cool. Okay. This was a treat. Thanks, Carol. We gave away trinkets. Woo! We're going to give you a trinket, too. Yay! Yay! <laughs> All right, so we'll see everyone um, next week. Ask an Engineer Show and Tell. We also have a couple more live videos, some Desa Lady Adas, and more. Thanks to all the way for team members here and far. Here and far. Mm -hmm. And uh, a couple other folks from Texas uh, let us know they're okay. And then uh, people are introducing themselves. There are some folks from Minnesota. Uh, Woo! In, in Minnesota. From River. Um, where DigiKey's at. Oh, yeah. Um, so our friends at DigiKey, I think, stopped by as well. I'd be so. cool if there's just people who did, aren't, they, like, moved to Thief River just to, like, do electronics so, like, I can just get parts idea. within one hour. Hey, the next That'd time cool. I'm in Minneapolis, I'm going to... You should totally go to Thief River Falls. I should. We know a guy. Yeah. We know Dave we know, President. We know <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. That would be fun. Okay. Well, thanks, y'all. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.